All right, so welcome to chapter 11, the muscle system. So we're gonna talk about um, how muscles actually function as far as like large muscle groups, how they function, how they actually create the actions that we see. Um, we'll also talk about how they're, they're named. And really that's what we're gonna focus on here today. Uh, we won't go over all the muscles like we did all the bones and the skeleton. Um, there's a lot for you to memorize in, in lab, and that's where I'll ask you those kinds of questions. Uh, however, I, I do expect on this lecture exam that if I gave you a certain characteristics of muscles, that you should be able to extrapolate that and give me a plausible name for it. Okay, And it'll be in a mul multiple choice sort of setting, so it's not like you have to come up with your own words. However, it, it, it should make sense. So anyway, we'll, you'll get a better idea as we go through this lecture what I mean by that. Okay. All right. Kind of move me down here. All right. So one of the things I want you to uh, definitely keep in mind is that muscles can only pull. Remember, we had talked about this before. Muscles can only contract, as you see in this image right here. They can't actually push a bone away. Now, that doesn't mean we can't get actions that are very push like, like either a punch or bench pressing. So let me just kind of try to show you guys how that's done. Um, and we, we get clues on these images. So you can kind of see the muscles that are highlighted here in the bench press. So these are pectoralis muscles, some deltoid muscles, and then um, tricep muscles, right? So basically what you're doing is you're going from here with your arms sort of at your side, you know, kind of maybe even like this, and you're going out to here. So let's just kind of analyze that movement for a second. Basically what your pectoralis muscles are doing is they're bringing your arm in, and then your tricep muscles are bringing your, bringing your arm out, or your forearm out, I should say. Right? So basically you have a movement that goes like this, and then like that. Now, mind you, it's a little bit more coordinated, so it's not like a jerky kind of know, karate chop kind of movement. Um, but basically it's due to muscles pull, pulling on the bones and extending your arm in front of you. Same thing for a punch. Pectoralis, deltoids holding your arm up, triceps pushing you out. Okay. Um, so again, kind of keep that in mind as you're going through your practical, that muscles are going to be pulling, not pushing. So when you're, you're at the practical, you're at a station, let's say you're blanking on an action, just take a look at the muscle and like where it's actually spanning and try to pretend or imagine like, okay, if I have to pull, what would that action be? And if I had to pull, what would that action be? What would that action be? Right? That, that's just my recommendation for you. So if you get kind of stuck, that's, that's a nice, easy way to maybe either jog your memory or at least try to get the right answer, try to work it out right, in, you know, right then and there. All right, so with that, let's talk a little bit more about like how muscles actually function. And I'm gonna hide me here. Um, something that you, you'll also see in, if you haven't already, uh, in lab is we're going to talk about the origins and insertions of muscles, right? So this is going to be really important because as you're going on into your allied health field um, and you, you're you going to be dealing with different injuries, uh, it's important to know that, all right, if I have an injury in this area of the body, what muscles might be affected? Not because they are directly impacted themselves, but their origins or insertions might be, okay? Or if you have inflammation in an area, um, what muscles might be uh, affected by that? Okay. So when we're talking about the origin of the muscle, basically it's the bone that the muscle is attached to that doesn't move when the muscle shortens. And when we're on the limbs, this will usually be proximal, so closer to the shoulder and closer to the hip. Um, so you can, you can see here on this biceps, right? the origin is up here in the scapula, the insertion is down on the radius. Um, so the origin, when you flex your bi bicep, um, or you contract your bicep, I should say, uh, the scapula does not move. It's actually your forearm that does the moving, right? So the origin is stable. Uh, the insertion, as we just mentioned, is the one that does then move. And another term for you, just the belly, that's the actual fleshy part of the muscle itself. Okay. And when we're talking about muscles and the way they're going to be I guess organized on the body, we're really talking about lever systems. So they're, they're gonna work on, on the principles of levers. And I think we all know how levers work. We've all set, uh, set on uh, seesaws, uh, maybe used a crowbar, you know, things like that. Um, maybe a dolly to help move furniture. So basically, levers are gonna give us a mechanical advantage. 
and they're either going to help us increase the muscle strength, like how strong whatever it is it's going to do, or increase its range of motion. Okay, so and that range of motion is just basically here's the fancy way of thinking of it is the maximum ability to move the bones of a joint through an arc. So range of motion is just how far you can move a, a body part. Okay, and as we'll see, depending on where you are in your body, you either have great large ranges of motion, right? You, you know, lots of movement, or the movement will be smaller but it'll be stronger. So that's sort of usually your trade-off. Either big movement, usually fast movement, or somewhat uh, slower movement. I mean, I'm not talking like super slow, just somewhat slower movement, um, but it'll be a lot stronger. Okay. So kind of some other definitions for you. It kind of just bring me back here. Uh, so uh, the, the point that the muscle is going to be and the bones are going to be moving around is going to be called the fulcrum. Okay, and basically our joints are going to be our fulcrum. Um, I think that kind of makes sense, right? Uh, the effort is going to be put in by the muscles. And then basically the resistance or the load is going to be either the weight of the limb or whatever it is that we might be holding or the weight of your body or the weight of whatever. Okay, uh, this will hopefully make sense in, in, a, in a couple of slides, we'll see some pictures. All right, now kind of hide me here. All right, so again, when we talk about lever systems and leverage, we're talking about mechanical advantage. And what we'll see in a, in a second is that muscles whose attachment is farther from the joint will produce the most force. So that's a classic example of, of this image right here. So imagine if, like the muscle is attached far away from the joint, which is this fulcrum. Um, it's going to produce enough force to lift this very heavy load. Okay. If the muscle is attached closer to the joint, so let's say this person was trying to push on this, I don't know, wood beam, whatever it is, um, right here, it'll have, basically it'll have a greater range of motion and a faster speed. However, it's going to take a lot more effort. I don't want to confuse you with this image on that. Let's uh, let's take a look at some of the other fulcrums that we'll actually find in our arm sorry, the levers we'll see we'll find in our bodies, and hopefully it'll make more sense. All right. So so in our bodies we have three different classes of levers. We have a first class, second class, third class lever. Uh, so in in the case of this first class lever, you can see that the fulcrum is in the middle. The effort is on one side. The load is on the other. In a second class lever, what we're seeing is the fulcrum is at one end, the load is in the middle, and the effort is on the other end. And then this third class lever, the fulcrum is also at one end, but now the effort is in the middle, and the load is at the end. Okay, so just think about what we said a second ago. The closer that effort is to the fulcrum, the greater the range of motion, however the weaker it'll be. So what we saw here a second ago was this this image right here was an example of a second class lever, um, where, and that was going to give us a lot of power, right? And, and hopefully this will make sense as we talk about these a little bit more. So let's just take a look at a first class lever, okay? Basically in this example, the fulcrum is going to be this the joint between the occipital bone, the occipital condyles, and the atlas. Um, so that's our fulcrum, that's, that's where we, our head will tip, right, either forwards or backwards. The weight is actually the weight of our face, right? And we know, and we know that, um, I mean, you know when you fall asleep, right? Your head kind of wants to like bob forward and then you catch yourself like, oh, oh yeah, but I wasn't sleeping, right? And then basically the effort is being put in um, by these, the, by the neck muscles in the back of your head, keeping your face and head upright, right? So that's a first class lever. Now a second class lever, again, this is the one that I was mentioning to you that uh, is similar to like a wheelbarrow. It will allow us to produce a lot of force because again, here's our fulcrum and then the, the effort, the muscle is as far away from that fulcrum as you can get. Okay, So again, the effort is the contraction of calf muscles which will pull your heel up off the floor. Now, I don't know how much, how much time you guys have spent in the gym, but if you've spent any time in the gym or just kind of think about this, um, you can stand on your, your toes, right? And if you go to the gym, there's plenty of machines where you know you, you, the, either the bar goes across your lap or on your shoulders and you have to like lift the weight. Now, all by yourself, I mean, just standing on your toes, you're lifting however many pounds you weigh. You know, I mean, without insulting every, anyone, we are all over at least, we're all at least over 100 pounds, 
right? That's a lot for a little calf muscle to lift off the ground. And then plus whatever it is that weight you are putting on your shoulders or across your lap belt, right? So that's pretty impressive for a muscle to be able to lift that much. Now compare that to say our biceps, right? So our biceps is closer to that fulcrum, the effort is closer to the fulcrum, which means it's mechanically weaker, but it produces a much larger range of motion, and it's actually going to be faster. The motion will be a lot faster. Um, so let me think about it. Again, as I was mentioning, you standing up on your toes, your calf muscles are lifting over 100 pounds, right? You're, I mean, I don't know you guys necessarily, but I'm going to say, like, you'd, you'd probably all struggle trying to curl 100 pounds with one hand, right? Um, so anyway, so again, much weaker um, mechanical advantage. However, greater range of motion, um, and it's much, I mean, much faster. We can do things a lot quicker with our hands than we can necessarily, like, raising up on our, you know, on our tiptoes. Okay. So just kind of taking a, a more closer look at the actual lever. Uh, our fulcrum in this case is going to be our elbow. The effort again is our biceps. And then the resistance or the load is going to be the weight of our hand or whatever it is that is in our hand, the weight that's in our hand. But you know, the hand itself is weighing something, so you can think of it either way, either empty or holding something. All right. The other thing that's going to um, determine how strong our muscles are is how the fascicles are actually arranged. So if you, you remember remember back to the fascicles when we talked about them. So basically the way the muscle fibers themselves run will determine how strong that muscle is. So let me kind of try to draw this and give you kind of a better idea about, about why that is. All right, so let's just take a look at this muscle, right? If we take a look at the number of fascicles so let's see if I, well, I can draw. Here's one, two, three, four, five fascicles maybe. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, about four, five or six, right? Fascicles in this one. So let's just say five to six in our image. Okay. And it says a contracting muscle can shorten to about 70% of its length. So this muscle can go from this length that you see here, and it probably can shorten to about, you know, this to this length, right? So basically it contracts to about 70% of its original length, right? So can this muscle, so can this one, all of these, right? But look at the way these things are running. So here we said we had five to six fascicles. Now let's just take a look at this muscle type right here. I mean, the number of fascicles, and it's, you know, it's all about the same size as this, right? We have one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, probably somewhere around, you know, twenty-six fascicles or so. So that is quite a bit of difference in number, right? So the more fascicles we can put into a an area, the more more those little myosin actin cross bridges we can form, the stronger the contraction is going to be. But again, this can only contract about 70% of its length. So 70% of its length is something like that. I mean, it's contracting this tiny little bit right here compared to this large bit right here. So that's what we mean by there's a compromise between force of contraction power and the range of motion. This arrangement will give you a, lot, a nice big range of motion. Not so much big range of motion here, but basically very powerful. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind too um, when you're looking at the muscles in, in lab. Look, look to see where, where they are arranged and, and how they're arranged. So again, like things like in, in our arms, we're going to see like the biceps is going to have this kind of an arrangement, right? Because we're going to want a big range of motion. And then other muscles where the range of motion won't be as important, but we need power, we'll, we'll see this kind of arrangement or even this kind of arrangement. In, just as an aside, total aside, um, in crustaceans, crabs, lobsters, that kind of thing, right? They, their skeletons are on the outside, so they, you know, you can't have these giant muscles kind of like like we have. Like you can't have a big old biceps just bulking up; it'll bust through the shell, right? So a lot of their muscles, to, so that they have really strong grip in their claws, their muscle arrangements are actually this type. 
just as a total aside. Next time you're out eating lobster or crab, take a look at their claw muscles and how they're actually attached. All right. Muscles are going to be arranged in opposing pairs, um, and we know this. If I extend my hand, I'm going to have to be able to flex it, or, or vice versa, flex, extend. We have to have opposite movements, so you can go back to wherever you, you know, wherever you started from. Okay. So here are just some definitions. So the prime mover or agonist, either term is fine. This is the muscle that contracts to cause a desired action. Okay. Um, the antagonist is going to have to yield to the prime mover. If both my biceps and my my triceps, those are classic agonist antagonist muscles. If both of them were equally uh, contracting, I wouldn't be able to move my arm. It would basically be rigid. Um, so if I'm basically um, flexing my biceps, right? I'm kind of doing that classic muscle, you know, builder uh, pose. My tricep has to relax so I can do that, so I can do that bicep curl. Conversely, when I'm relaxing my arm back to that anatomical position, my biceps has to relax and my tricep takes over. Okay, so one has to yield to the other. Um, a synergist is going to stabilize nearby joints, and then fixators are going to stabilize the origin of the prime mover. Just sort of, whenever you're, you're, you're very rarely only using one muscle in any kind of action. Usually it's a group of muscles working together to make sure everything is nice and stable when you do it. Okay. Um, for our purposes, we really focus in on the agonist and the antagonist. All right. I'm just going to, I'm going to pause this here. Um, we'll get on to naming skeletal muscles. Uh, it'll be very short, so the second recording won't be as long as this one. Um, but I kind of just want to give you guys a little bit of a break. If you have any questions on levers, uh, please do not hesitate to email me. More than happy to go over the concept again. I know it can be a little bit tricky sometimes. Um, so if that's it, I will see you in the next video.